Hello, so welcome to CST3205, and in this lecture I'm going to be explaining uh, how Hibernate works. So what Hibernate does, um, as do many of these kind of uh, frameworks, is it creates a mapping uh, between data in tables in a database and objects in memory. So you, it sort of converts the data in database into objects that you manipulate using standard object-oriented programming, and then you can also choose to persist these objects when you're, when you're working with them in your program, and that will in then Hibernate will then uh, save that data to the database. So it's sort of a way in which you can fluidly, semi-fluidly, and easy, semi-easily um, create a nice relationship between a database and objects in code. So that's what object relational mapping is, so I'll explain that first in more detail. And uh, then I'll go into Hibernate, how Hibernate works, how hi then um, go and explain what... Uh, how you can set up Hibernate, because you need to specify what relationships you want between the data and the tables and uh, your objects in memory. And then I'll show you how you can sort of get it all running. And then I'll give some examples of, uh, you know, uh, adding data to the database using Hibernate, selecting it, updating, deleting data. So these are very, very basic, you know, examples, okay? So all of this lecture is intended as a, as a very simple introduction to Hibernate, right? I'm not going to give you the, you know, I could spend five lectures explaining all the fine, fine details of the functionality, but I think it's better to cover, you know, lots of different technologies in this course. So I'm just going to introduce you to Hibernate. You're going to be using Hibernate in coursework. And if you've, you know, and obviously it'd be good if you could take it further yourselves, yeah? And then finally, at the end, I'm going to say a little bit about uh, Hibernate and Threads and uh, Hibernate and Spring. Okay, so object relational mapping. So, as, me as those of you, those of you in my course last year um, would have used, uh, if you did coursework three, you would use SQL to manipulate data in a database. Extremely common, right? Some of you in uh, some of you in foundation year or in previous courses also use SQL commands to manipulate data in the database. Yeah, so you're writing a bit of code. Right? This is when we're writing programs that do this, obviously. So they write a bit of code, then you kind of dynamically build up a string um, that contains the SQL commands, maybe with a bit of data inside of it from your program, and then you'll execute that SQL command in the database and maybe do something with the result. And that sort of approach, you know, it's great for simple applications. I actually recommend you to use this approach in Course 1 for building a RESTful web service, um, but it has some limitations. The main limitation um, is that when you have big applications, you can end up with a large amount of messy SQL, okay? And this S messy SQL is going to be difficult to maintain and have tons and tons of duplicate code, yeah? So, you know, you'll, it's, it's fine if you've got like 10 SQL commands, but if you've got like a thousand S SQL statements you've got to execute on a database, things are going to get pretty messy, right? And in particular, it's going to be really hard to change the relational database management system because they don't, they support a core set of SQL functionality, but then that sort of change, you know, there's a sort of periphery, um, which, you know, is, which varies between the different um, uh, relational database management systems. And I think I've got a, um, yeah, okay, so, um, and so what you end up with, so this is, um, a bunch of database code from a spike stream, a sort of spike in your network simulator I wrote a while back. And this had a, it could use, it used the database to kind of store all these networks and the connections, all the connections between the neurons, all this kind of stuff. So to make this work, um, I had to write loads and loads of code um, that looked, you know, it was almost all the same, right? It had, it had exactly what I just described. We've got the SQL statement and maybe the values are dynamically added. So it kind of built up this query, executed the query, handled the response. And all this stuff was, you know, it was all different. I had a, you know, it wasn't like I was repeating the methods pointlessly, but it, um, there was an enormous amount of overlap between the code, a lot of redundant stuff. It was, uh, it was, it was messy. This is only a small sample of the code. I actually had loads and loads of classes that mapped onto the different tables and executed different codes on the tables. And, you know, it was really difficult. Um, it wasn't, you know, not, it was sort of easy-ish to write because it was all similar, but at the same time, it was, it was kind of gets hard to maintain. More importantly, um, it doesn't let me, it's very, becomes very difficult to change anything about the database. Your code has this very tight relationship with the database. So it's really hard to change the database without messing around with changing the code. So for example, I uh, had a, a table called connections, right? So we've got lots of statements here that are selecting from connections or from networks or whatever. But if for some reason I wanted to modify the database structure, right? So maybe, you know, maybe it made sense to change connections to something else, or I need to add a new table called connections and change this one, whatever it was, then I've got to change all of this code. I've got to sort of fish through this code 
and find the bits in it that refer to the connections table and then change the name of the connections table or the structure of the thing or whatever. So it becomes very inflexible if you want to actually change the way the data is represented in your database because of you know some kind of improvements you want to make. You can't make those improvements to the database without also changing all of this um, messy code at the same time. So it's, it's, it's got some real limitations once you try and scale up your database access um, if you're doing it in this way. There's also a sort of more formal statement to this kind of problem called the object relational impedance mismatch. And this is just a very slightly fancy way of saying that the object models in code and relational models in a database uh, don't work well together. Yeah, on, on the one hand, you've got the relational database management system having this sort of sets of tables and the foreign key relationships between them and all this kind of stuff. And on the other hand, you've got code, right, where you're working with objects in memory that have a sort of a very different way of relationship, re uh, representing relationships. In fact, um, with object-oriented programming languages, you have data as this kind of interconnected graph. You've got one object that has reference to another object that has reference to another object. These are like sort of a, a graph where you have like nodes, and then you have uh, links between these nodes. And so some, these are some of the problems uh, that are sort of formally stated with this object relational impedance mismatch problem. So we've got granularity, right? So I might want to write some object-oriented code that has less objects than there are tables in the database, right? What I'm using in my code might be different from what's in the database because I might be doing a task that uses that data but doesn't use all of that data or uses that data in a different way. There's inheritance. So object-oriented programming, we often have, you know, inheritance. We have a student who's a person who's a, an animal or something like that, right? This kind of stuff can probably probably be fudged uh, with tables and foreign keys, but it's certainly not, you know, supported or a natural way of handling these things. Then uh, we have relational database management systems, which is a single type of identity, which is the primary key. So two rows are the same row if they've got the same primary key, right? Um, or, you know, uh, although again, you could, you could fudge it with relational database management systems. Um, whereas Java has a very explicit um, distinction between two types of object identity. So if you talk about A equals to B, um, with Java, you always have references, yeah? So A and B here are, very, are basically pointers. They're pointing um, to, an object, to an actual object, an instance of a class um, that's sitting there in memory somewhere, yeah? So when you say A equals B in this way, we're saying that A points to some kind of data structure in memory, B points, and that B points to the same data structure in memory. So if I change A, I'm also immediately changing B because they're just pointing to the same thing, yeah? So that's one kind of object identity. And then we have object equality in Java, where if it like A dot equals, which is a slightly messy way of writing it. Um, and so if in this case, we're saying that all of the data in the variables, we, we sort of can override this method, all the data in the variables here is, is the same as the data in, the, in, in B's variables. So, so if A equals B like that, then A dot equals B will also be true. Um, but um, if A dot equals B, is true, that doesn't mean that they're necessarily the same object. I might have two very simple classes that both contain the same string, and in which, in which case a dot equals b will be true um, because uh, it's the same string, but if they're two separate instances of a, my class, um, then that will not be true. So these are two distinct um, but sometimes overlapping uh, forms of object identity. And that doesn't exist in, you know, from the ground up and naturally in any way in a relation to database management system. Then we have association. So in relational database management systems, you have uh, foreign keys, right? And a foreign key is a bi-directional relationship. You know, one table has, even though it's kind of pointing to the, you know, the uh, primary key of the other key of the other table or whatever, it's still bi-directional, right? You can move from one to the other and from the other back to the other one, yeah? Whereas object-oriented programming, um, you have a unidirectional association. So in the example I gave you earlier, we had a car that contained a person class, right? Car class containing a person class. So in that case, the car class contains a reference to a person class. That's a one-way relationship. But the person class that's inside the car class doesn't have a relation, doesn't have a reference to the car class. In my simple example, I mean, it could have, but it doesn't. Yeah. So, in, so in my so typically with object-oriented programming, you're only setting up as a unidirectional association. One class contains another class, but the class that could, but the inner class, so to speak, um, doesn't have a reference back to the first class. And we have the data navigation. So with relational database management systems, we're typically running search operations and finding a match based on the search string. But with object-oriented programming languages, uh, we move through data. You know, we have a we can you know in, in very different ways. You know, we can you know 
following pointers and all that kind of stuff if, or other ways. So all of these one, two, three, or five problems um, uh, sort of indicate um, that these are all issues with the fact that you've got two different ways of representing data and two different ways of manipulating data in your program, the object you're into the program, and in your database, okay? So to address these problems, to make it easier to work with objects that are also cont that contain data that comes from a database, um, to handle these problems, many people use uh, what's called an object relational mapping framework, or ORM framework. So in this case, we're converting rows in the database into objects in code. Then you, in your code, you create, delete, manipulate objects. So you're just dealing with objects in your object-oriented program. But behind the scenes, the ORM framework is connecting to the database and creating, deleting, and updating uh, the corresponding data in the database. So all of that messy, most of that messy SQL, you don't have to worry about anymore. All you deal with are objects, and then you're carrying out operations on those objects. So it's sort of making it much easier to deal with data uh, when you're writing object-oriented code. That's the idea. So this is idea. So here we have our, our object-oriented programming uh, and our ORM, ORM framework here and the relational database here. So the ORM framework, we set up a mapping between these objects in memory in our program and these objects in the database. So in our code, we can play around with these and do what we like with these. And once, if we set the mapping up correctly, we can then cause the data in these objects to be stored kind of automatically behind the scenes in the database. And we can then pull out objects from the database using this mapping that correspond to you know, particular bits of data in that database. So, we, so our code becomes much more smooth, much more maintainable, much less messy um, because we're dealing with just objects. And then by changing the mapping, we can then map onto a different database, or we can change the names of these tables. We've created a sort of bit of middleware, if you like, um, that makes that decouples the relational database from the object-oriented programming, um, which has many advantages when we're talk when we're using when we're writing bigger applications. So some of the, these are some of the advantages. So we can abstract away from the details of particular databases. So this code. Once it doesn't care, need to care about you know whether we've got two tables here, three tables, five tables, and what the names of these tables and the and the columns are in these tables. Yeah, this code doesn't have to care about that because if we want to change that, all we have to change that is the mapping here. So obviously that makes it easier to change databases and tables without messing around changing large numbers of SQL statements. And further advantage, which is sort of less obvious. Um, is that it minimizes and speeds up database access with smart fetching strategies. So you might think um, that having all this mapping framework and the ORM thing and all the rest of it um, actually makes your code run slower than running raw SQL on the database. And maybe under some circumstances that's true. But under a lot of circumstances, this ORM framework can be smart about how it interacts with the database, and that can actually speed up your database access and use your database resources more efficiently. So for example, um, if this ORM framework can kind of cache data from the, from the database, you know, making faster access time in memory by just directly accessing the ORM. And it can also be intelligent about, you know, if I persist an object that's the same as data that's already in the database, um, then it doesn't need to actually, you know, run extra SQL commands. So it can, although it's an extra layer, if you like, it can actually um, speed up and improve the performance of your database uh, code. So in JavaScript, um, there's a few ORM frameworks. So we've got like SQLize or Objection.js. So there's a general pointer, right? I mean, this might all seem super esoteric, an enormous amount of work um, for very little reward, right? When you can just write some raw SQL. But take note that, you know, uh, a lot of programming languages, people have written quite a few of these ORM frameworks. So there's a, you know, there's a very strong reason driving people to to go with the ORM, ORM approach. Yeah? So in JavaScript, you know, people have spent a lot of time creating these because they really believe that ORM frameworks are worth having. So although there are JavaScript ORM frameworks in Coursework 1, um, I'm not going to put any requirement to use them. Yeah? So um, it's firstly, it's easier um, to develop with a very small application. It's easier just using SQL commands. Um, but also, um, I think it's worth practicing your SQL as well. Yeah? So I, I'd like you to get better at writing SQL. And a good way to do that is include, include like bits of SQL in your code. Yeah, if it's, if you were writing a really big, you know, website with lots and lots of SQL commands and all the rest of it, I would totally recommend using one of these JavaScript ORM frameworks or whichever one's better than these. I'm, I've no idea. But in the case of your coursework, 
it might be better to practice your SQL because you're going to be using hi the Hibernate ORM framework for your Java, so you're going to get practice with both that way. But it's entirely up to you. If you want to use an o ORM framework for your uh, web server, that's fine too. Yeah? So it turns out Java's got quite a few ORM frameworks. Um, as far as I can tell, you know, I'm not some kind of enterprise architect. If I was, I'd be paid like 100 k and, you know, it wouldn't be given this lecture, right? Um, but as far as I can tell, um, Java has a number of these ORM frameworks because, again, it's a very nice way of, particularly once you think in terms of Java beans and configuring Java beans and all that, it's, it's a nice way to, you know, to set up your database access. I can, as far as I can tell, Hibernate's the most popular. It integrates with Spring, so you can use Spring to inject some of the things you need um, to make all this work. And there's lots of job opportunities in Hibernate as well, which is another reason I included it in this course. Yeah, so took a little look on techno jobs, and we've got, you know, uh, 13 pages of jobs. I mean, there might be a bit of junk at the end, but you get the general idea, yeah? And so typically, um, you get Hibernate and Spring, uh, this sort of natural partners. And in this lecture, I'm not, there just isn't time to go into the details of, you know, the benefits of using Spring and Hibernate. So you're going to learn them separately, um, but there are ways, I'll briefly, you know, say how you can put them together. There are nice ways of putting Spring and Hibernate together, and I'll give you a link to the tutorial on that at the end. But anyway, general point being, um, there's lots of jobs in Hibernate, because lots of people are using these kind of ORM frameworks. So let's go into Hibernate in a little bit more detail now. So it's an object relational mapping solution for Java. Maps between Java classes and database tables, um, and it maps Java data types to SQL data types because obviously you've got that issue that SQL has its own set of data types and Java's got its own set of data types, but Hibernate does the job of converting one into the other and doing this mapping for you. So you can do all the stuff you can do with SQL, like you know, add data, delete data, update data, and so on and so forth, and search for data. And the sort of, you know, as far as I can see, roughly. Um, Hibernate's aiming to eliminate roughly 95% uh, of SQL data processing in a program. So if you look at my example of my C++ code, um, you know, we've got, this is like 100% of like, you know, fairly, you know, messy, dirty SQL. And Hibernate's aiming to get rid of about 95% uh, of that, yeah? But it doesn't completely um, eliminate, you know, you're probably not going to get rid of all of it. There might, there's always probably going to be some kind of little messy bits that you, that you can't really eat, can't do in a simple, clean way with Hibernate. So you can still use SQL when you need to. You can always drop down a level and actually directly execute SQL commands in the database when you need to. But 95% of the time, you're not going to. You're not going to need to because Hibernate's going to do all that work for you. Yeah. So the less you use SQL, the better, um, because then there'll be less work to do um, if you want to change the database structure or something like that. So to install Hibernate, um, you need the Hibernate libraries. There's a few sort of core Hibernate libraries. As is typical, um, these Hibernate libraries have dependencies on other libraries, third-party libraries, like logging and all the rest of it. Um, and there's also an SQL driver that you need, in this case, the MySQL driver, um, because unless you're using a di different uh, SQL database. The best way to do it um, it's to configure Maven to download these libraries. I'll explain because then obviously that you just need to chuck in a few, uh, add in a little couple of chunks of XML and then it's all done for you. Or if you want to just have a play around with Hibernate uh, independently of Maven, um, you can just use the jar files from the course website. So these are the dependencies you need to include. So it's just so easy with Maven, right? You just chuck in, you know, the group ID, artifact ID, version ID of Hibernate, and then that will automatically uh, pull down all the dependencies that these libraries have as well. And then we have the MySQL connector as well. So that's like a separate thing. I think you get it from the MySQL website, but I've also uh, put it on the course website. Um, but anyway, you don't need it because there it is. Just chuck it into your Maven file. Um, and then Maven, similar, similar to Spring, Maven has uh, configuration files. So here we've got, I've got a resources folder somewhere or other, um, and uh, this might be slightly out of date, but anyway, um, we've got a Hibernate configuration file we need to include in Maven in the same way we had our Spring configuration file, and we have a series of mapping files if we're using the XML approach that also need to be included. So we've got some XML files that we need, and obviously we need the uh, actual libraries and the SQL driver. If you want to just run it sort of locally within NetBeans or whatever, then you need like these 12 libraries, which is Hibernate and its dependencies. And you also need the MySQL driver for Java, which is available. All this is available on the course website. 
So before Hibernate can run, it obviously needs to be able to connect to your database, um, and it needs uh, the mapping files as well, so it, or mapping files, or know where to find the mapping mapping information. Yeah. So the database connection is configured using this XML file, um, and the mapping. So the, so there's an XML file that sets the whole thing up for Hibernate. Yeah. It specifies the database connection and where it can find the the mapping information. The mapping itself we can do in two ways. Uh, we can use XML files to specify the mapping between Java objects and database tables. Or well, there's also a way of doing this using Java annotations. Excuse me. And I'll show you both ways in this um, in this lecture. So Java annotations sort of came more recently, um, but I strongly suspect that in, if you go and work in the commercial world using Hibernate, you'll probably be using XML files um, to do the mapping between you. There's, I, I think it's a bit like Spring that. Um, they put the annotation stuff in, and it's nice, and it's easier in some ways than messing around with lots of separate XML files. But um, there's probably arguments about um, you know keeping the mapping information separate from the code, so that you don't have to like intervene or mess around recompiling your entire application if you change something in the database. So there's there's possibly a it's, it's probably slightly easier using annotations, but also maybe a little bit more messy and a little bit less beautiful in terms of architecture. So it's good knowing about either method, and if you if you end up working in Hibernate, you're probably going to use you know one or both. Yeah? And in your coursework, I don't care what you use, um, as long as you use one method, Yeah, because there's marks for using Hibernate. So let's start with the database configuration file. So this, you're always going to need this, I think. I mean, maybe there's some you know other way of setting up Hibernate, but this is kind of typical. We create a file called Hibernate config or cfg.xml. And that contains everything Hibernate needs to work. Yeah. So this is an example of the file. So at the top of that, we've got the usual, you know, blah 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 XML stuff. Um, and on top of the file, we've got the um, all the stuff that Hibernate needs to connect to the database. Yeah. So in this case, it's going to use that. You remember that uh, jar file I mentioned earlier? This this thing here. So here we're telling it to use that particular driver to connect to the database. And then we're giving it the URL of the database, in this case, localhost. It'll presume you know the port automatically. Um, and we're saying we're going to use, connect to the price comparison database. That's the name of my database. So you need to replace that with the name of your database. And I found that this was essential uh, for getting the thing to work. Basically, there's some, you know, you get some kind of nasty error if you don't stick in server time zone UTC, something to do with, you know, whatever. It doesn't matter. I looked it up and, you know, turns out without that, you just get some crash and nasty error here. And in this case, I'm just connecting to a database with root and no password, but hopefully you've set up your database a little bit more rigorously. Um, okay, yeah, that's the point about that. And then at the bottom here, um, we've got a bunch of sort of properties of this database connection and Hibernate um, that we can then specify. So for example, I've set the connection pool size to five. So that means I can have five simultaneous connections to the database. So if I was had, um, so for example, if my application had five threads, I'd want this to be at least five, probably a couple more to be on the safe side. Um, and as long as I'm managing the, the connections properly and closing them and all the rest of it, um, then I'll be fine with five threads. Uh, having this set to five or more, say, but if you're using, you know, 100 threads or something, then you're going to have to increase that number. And then, you know, I've also set hibernate show SQL to be true. This is kind of like a debugging thing. So you can see, because behind the scenes, Hibernate's constantly executing SQL statements to keep the Java objects up to date or, you know, whatever, keep the database up to date. Um, so you can actually see those SQL statements, and you'll see that when I run my examples, if I set that to true. And there's various other bits and bobs you can set um, set up in this file. Okay, so that's how, how, we need to, how we configure Hibernate, so it can sort of load up and connect to the database. That's the Hibernate side. But before it'll actually work, um, we need to specify the relationship between the objects in our code and uh, the database tables and the columns and stuff in, the, in those tables. And that's what the Hibernate mapping does. So we need to specify the relationship between columns and tables in the database and Java objects in our code. Now, so the older versions of Hibernate use XML mapping files to specify this relationship. Um, and these mapping files are then listed in the Hibernate configuration file. So again, it's a bit like Spring. So with Spring, we created like a sort of beans file, right? That's listed all the beans and then listed, you know, which bean was inside the other bean and all this kind of dependency stuff, yeah? And it's a bit like that with Hibernate too. They're obviously inspired by the same kind of architecture, architectural pattern or whatever. Um, 
So we have these mapping files that specify the relationship between a particular table or set of tables and an object in memory and a Java object. And we create all these different configuration files, or you probably bung them in the same configuration file. Um, and then Hibernate will load them, and then it'll be able to do this uh, object relational mapping. So it's got some advantages, as I said, this XML approach. It's probably common in the industry. I doubt they've upgraded it in a lot of old, more legacy systems. And, you know, maybe you want to go with that approach anyway, then you can sort of validate the XML and make sure it all makes sense. So to make this work, first, we're going to do, first thing we need to do is create a class that contains the variables that are going to correspond to data in the database. Okay, sensible, right? And then we're going to use this XML file to, spec best to specify the relationship between columns in the tables and the variables. And then at the runtime, we're going to interact with instances of the class, and Hibernate will manage the database behind the scenes for us. We don't have to write, you know, we could, you know, do uh, write an entire application uh, if we stayed within this 95% space managed by Hibernate. If we stayed within that space, we wouldn't have to write a single line of SQL code, yeah? So I gave you this example database, uh, I think, you know, a few weeks ago. Um, recently, I realized it's actually a bad example, but I told you it was anyway, because this serial actually need, needs to contain, we need to contain, have the same product linked to multiple prices. So actually this would break like first normal form if we tried to put lots of prices in here. So actually you need a separate table for the price mapping that links products and prices. But anyway, I told you it was bad and I'm just using it as an example. And it also should be called serials because there's um, the diagram I did before I actually did the database. But anyway, never mind. So I'm gonna show you the mapping, how we can create a mapping between this serial table and our, a class and a Java class. So here's my serial XML, I just call it XML because I'm just, you know, using it to illustrate the XML method. Um, and this is like one row of our, this corresponds to one row in our serial table, yeah? That's why I've called it serial. And it's, first thing you'll see, it's kind of standard Java bean, apart from the serialize, serializable bit, right? We've got the bunch of private variables, we've got an empty constructor, and a bunch of getter and, and setters that will allow other classes to manipulate these, the data in these private variables. Now these private variables all correspond uh, to this particular data in the database. So we've got like ID, product types, and so forth. And as I said, we've got the getter and setters that you know enable us to manipulate these private variables. So Hibernate obviously needs to be able to get and set these variables, and that's why we need all this stuff. It's kind of messy. I don't know why Java doesn't build this in automatically somewhere, but anyway, never mind. So we create our serial class with these variables that we want to correspond to data in the database. And then we create our serial XML file that does this mapping for us. So the first thing we need to specify is the name of the class that's being mapped. So serial um, is, this, is in this package here, EU Dave Gamers Hibernate Serial, so that's the name of the class being mapped, and this is the table that we're mapping it onto. Now I think, I'm no, you know, Hibernate WizKid, but I'm pretty sure that you can map a single Java class onto multiple tables, but I'm not going to cover any of this sort of more advanced stuff here. I'm just going to focus on, you know, a very simple case where we've got one class corresponding to what part or all of a, a particular table. So this uh, serial class is mapping onto this table serials. And then at the top of this, we've got the ID. And this is the way in which it's this, this ID field here correspond is like the primary key of the class, if you like, you can say it that way. So this primary key of the class maps onto the primary key of the table. So we can, you know, make sure we've got a unique serial and we're not trying, because obviously if you want to up, make the, save this serial to the database, the data, the Hibernate needs some way of figuring out which serial needs to be saved or updated, all this kind of stuff. So we have an ID and this is like the sort of auto increment sort of specification here and column name ID is specifying that this particular field in the class, this variable in the class, corresponds to this particular column in the table, ID here. Then we've got more straightforward classes, more straightforward variables, mappings. Um, so here we've got like product type ID, that's the name in the class. If you look at the back of the class, right, we've got our product type ID, is the name of the class here. Specifying, so what we're specifying here is that this variable in the class, which is of type integer, maps onto this particular column um, in this table, which is also, which is type integer, as opposed to int, it's like, it, but Hibernate can handle the mapping between Java data types and, and uh, S MySQL data types. So it should be pretty clear, that's the variable name being mapped onto this particular uh, column in the table, yeah? And we do that for all of our variables. And we don't have to do it for all of them, right? If I only want to map like the ID and the product type ID, I can do that too, right? I can create classes that have part 
uh, sort of partial relationship with the data in the table, and that's one of the sort of strengths of Hibernate, because then I could change my serial thing, add a couple of extra fields, and without changing a line in my code, because it would still map onto the bits that it needed for the actual code to work. So once we've created this mapping file, serial hbm.xml, we then need to tell Hibernate to use this mapping file um, in its so that you know so that we can use it in our code. And this is what we have here. We have mapping resource equals resources serial hbm.xml, and we can have multiple mapping resources added there, or we can add multiple Hibernate mappings. We can add multiple classes here as well, right? So, so we've got it kind of flexible. You create a separate XML file for each class, or you could have one big XML file containing all the mappings. It's, you know, Hibernate will either combine them for you if you've got them in separate folders, which might be a better way of doing it, or uh, if it's up, for some reason you might want to just put them all in the same in the same uh, file, although that could be messy once you start getting to large numbers of classes. So that's the XML method, okay? Um, and then we also got the annotation method. Um, in this case, again, we create the class we want to map, but instead of doing this XML configuration where we have a separate file specifying the mapping, uh, we use Java annotations within the class to specify the relationship between variables in the class and columns in the database. And then we say in Hibernate config XML, we specify um, which classes have been annotated in this way so that Hibernate can manage the mappings. So obviously you can see the disadvantage of this, right? Because we're putting inside the class um, all of these annotations. So then we've actually got to modify a code if we modify the database. And it's somehow nice, I think, if you're modifying an XML file when you modify the database rather than having to go into the annotated classes. But on the other hand, it's only a single class you've got to change. So it's much easier than the sort of SQL approach where you've got to go through all these different strings where you might have you might have 20 methods accessing the same table, which then you've got to change all those 20 methods um, if you do it in the um, without the if you do it without Hibernate. So these are some of the annotations. I mean, I'll just probably easier just give me an example, but we can specify that particular variable is an ID, is the primary key, and we specify that the class is something that needs to be mapped. We specify the table that we want to map this particular class onto. As I said, I'm pretty sure you can do multiple tables. Um, and then we connect a particular variable to a column database, and then this is like handling how primary keys are generated. So here's my annotated class. So at the top of this, we're saying it's an entity, i.e. this is a kind of class that Hibernate should process to find mappings. And we're saying that in this case, the name, we're mapping this class onto the table, onto the serials table. So ignore my bad diagram because it should actually be serials, not serial, but the name here should correspond to serials here, yeah? And then we've got the variables that we want to map. So instead of having the XML, we're doing exactly the same thing here. I'm just using this annotation stuff. So we're saying that, uh, for example, the top one here is the ID. So this is the way in which we can map a unique class to a unique row and the generate the auto generated stuff. Um, and we're saying the column name ID here is being it should has to correspond to this ID in the table. And if you look at a more straightforward one, we're saying that this variable here, product type ID, is being mapped onto product type ID in the table. Yeah. So that you know, if if we save this class to the database, then the, this value will be saved into this into this uh, in, into a row here that corresponded to this particular ID. It's something like that. So it's pretty easy, right? Create this class with all these annotations, and then instead of having mapping, if you look in the here. We're doing mapping resource and then the name of the file. When we're using annotations, um, we do uh, mapping class and then we specify the name of the class. And we, of course, we get multiple classes here. And then Hibernate will look at the annotations and generate and you know load up the mappings in the same way it does with the XML file. Uh, is there something to say? Oh yeah, so this is a Java bean, same way as you know, same way as the other serial XML Java. Right, well, there's not exactly a demo to do here, but I'll just quickly show you, the, you know, how it looks in code. So, so first we've got the Hibernate config file here. In this case, I'm using the XML mapping in my config file, where I've actually got this is the XML config, this is the XML config file, but I also did an annotations example, and these are all available for you. And that's like serial annotations, so that's showing the mapping with the annotations, and that's setting up the map of mapping with the um, configuration file. And then, the, yeah, well, this is all the sort of database connection, all that sort of stuff that sets up Hibernate. And then we've got our classes. We've got the serial XML, which is like the, you know, the bean um, with the, the, that we're going to map with a separate XML file. And then we've got the bean uh, that we're mapping using the annotation notation. And then um, what, else we, what else we need here? Oh, yeah, and then we've got the serial XML. If we're using XML mapping, 
um, then there's my XML file. So you can see they've just got a folder called resources with all these different, um, with the XML files in it. And then we've got our, you know, Java classes that are actually being mapped onto the database, either using the annotations or using the uh, XML, uh, XML mapping files. Right, so now we're ready to roll, right? We've got the, we've got Hibernate, it's running, connected to the database and so on and so forth. We've got the, and we've set up the mapping between the, the obt cl Java classes and the data in the database. Now we can actually get our, boot up our Java, uh, our Hib Java with Hibernate and then actually start to do some stuff. So in this section, I'm just gonna show you how you can get it working. And then the next section, I'll show you some of the useful stuff you can do with it once it is working. I also need to explain a little bit about um, some of the core classes you're going to be using when you use Hibernate. So what you're going to be using most of the time are sessions. And the idea of a session is that it's a class that you use within a single thread. Okay, it's not, not thread-safe at all sessions. So with a session, you know, you can use that to get a Get the connect, it'll get the connection with the database for you, and then you can use the session to do read, delete, write, search, all the rest of it on uh, on the database. Yeah. So within a session, we're doing all the useful stuff with the database, um, and a session um, can, is used to execute transactions. Okay. And a transaction is a sort of small block of work um, that is executed on the database. And roughly, a transaction will move the database from one consistent state to another. That's the idea in an SQL database of a transaction. And you should keep your transactions sort of nice and small and modular, because um, if two threads are trying to carry out transactions on the same bit of the data, um, then one thread's going to have to wait for another, and you obviously want to minimize that. So you, do, so you want to have just short, punchy transactions, and you can have multiple transactions within a particular session. So I think... The sort of rough idea would be if you have one, a session would correspond to one sort of handling one sort of HTTP request. If we were talking, if we were doing a, you know, a web application of some kind, then the, when we receive the HTTP request, like some kind of post for registration or something, um, then we'd open up a session. Dealing with the registration request in this example would be maybe require several transactions. Maybe we have to create the user and then, you know, store the address somewhere and all the rest of it. So we might have a, so we have a single session within a single thread handling that that um, that interaction with the user, and then multiple transactions. And at the end of our interaction with the HTTP, we'd send back the response, and then we'd uh, close the session. Yeah, that's the general idea. Now, because sessions are kind of quite lightweight and uh, easy to create and close and all the rest of it, uh, we need some way of creating sessions, and that's what this session factory is for. So the session factory has the mappings for the database, um, but the main thing we use it for is to create instances of sessions when we need them. So typically you have a session factory that's shared between all of your threads, um, and then, e then you, the threads will use that session factory to get a new session. They use that session within their sort of run method, and then they'll close that session when they finish that run method. Yeah? So this is a pattern you'll find quite commonly in lots of different bits of Java, that you have this idea of a factory, and the factory is used to produce objects um, of a particular type. Yeah, so the session factory in this case manufactures uh, sessions, right? That's the idea of it. The other thing you need to get a little bit clear on when using Hibernate um, is the different states or yeah, modes objects can be in. Yeah? So you remember we have objects that are mapped to database tables. So and so the the nature the strength of that connection determines whether it's a persistent object, a transient object, or a detached object, and also the history of that connection. So a persistent object is a Java object that's associated with a particular session. It's short-lived, single-threaded, and it's tied to data in the database. So you change that object, um, and you can persist those changes to the database because that object, this Hibernate knows that that object's mapped onto a particular row in the database. So that's a persistent object, and obviously it persists, right? Or you can make it persist if you call save on it, whatever. Um, then we have transient objects. So if within our application we just create some Java class, create a new instance of our um, serials, XML, Java, we just create a new instance of it, right? And we're not creating it within a session, and we're not doing anything specific Hibernate-wise. Um, that's what's called a transient object. We can make that transient object persistent um, by doing stuff with it to it within a session. Um, but in its initial state, when we just create a Java class, um, that's just transient, okay? It's not going to be saved in the database in any way. And then we also have the idea of a detached object. 
Within a session, we might create a class and we might use that, persist that load data, you know, connect that class to, to a particular row in a table, and we might manipulate the data in the database using that class. Um, but at the end of the session, this class might still exist, um, but then it will exist in the detached state. So it has been persistent at one point, um, but then the session's been closed and it's no longer tied to data in the database. So we can't persist that class anymore unless we do something with it to make it persistent again. So it's a class that was persistent, but is no longer persistent. So worth getting that stuff clear because, you know, otherwise you're likely to get confused if you're just creating Java classes and imagine that they're going to be connected to the database even though they're outside of a session. Um, or if you have a class that was connected to the database but then it is no longer because you closed the session, um, then, you know, again, there's potential confusion there which can be avoided. So this is my little sort of simple Hibernate example. So what I'm going to show here is just the, the sort of boilerplate stuff you need to do to get Hibernate running. And then in the next section, I'll show you the details of doing actual operations on the database. So in this example, I've created this uh, session factory just as a sort of private variable. So initially, obviously, that's just going to be a null pointer. You know, if we try and do something with it, it's just going to, you know, throw an exception. So what I need to do is I need to initiate, I have a, like an init method that sets up my session factory for me. And what this session init method is doing is it's uh, doing all the stuff. In this case, is this is an XML example. So it's kind of building up this sort of, you know, obscure Hibernate classes we don't really need to care about. It's basically creating this registry, which is a way of building up uh, a mapping between the data. It's going to connect to the database, and it's going to build up a mapping between. It's, uh, it's going to load all the mappings between the database tables and the classes and the Java classes. So we can, once we've got our registry, um, we can then build our session factory. You can just don't worry about the details of this. What you what you need to understand is we need to call init and all that stuff in order to make this into a real instance of a session factory, not just a null pointer. Yeah. So we call that, call that stuff, it'll bit, load up all the configuration information and build our session factory. That's what we care about here. Once we've got our session factory, we can then do something with it and actually store and access data and so on and so forth. So my main method, what I'm doing is I'm calling this init, um, this init method I just described. Um, and then I'm going to, then I can carry out operations. So I'll go into the next section, explain how we can write a method that searches for serials or add serials and so on and so forth. And the end of, end of it all, uh, we need to call shutdown, okay? We need to shut down our session factory cleanly um, to make sure that we don't have any uh, sort of hanging connections, we haven't closed properly, because what you'll find with databases is you can often um, have a lot of hanging connections. That, so, the data, so the relational database management system thinks that you're still connected, but your code's finished, and then it'll run out of available connections, and you won't be able to connect to the database anymore. So what we need to do is we need to shut down and cleanly close the session factory. Presumably, that's going to shut down all open sessions and release all the connections to the database. Right, so that's the... The framework stuff, right? We've we've connected Hibernate's database, specified the mappings, and I've shown you how we get the session factory uh, initialized and ready to go. Yeah, now we can actually do some proper stuff accessing data with Hibernate. But obviously, as I mentioned at the beginning of this lecture, this is not going to go into all the nuts and bolts of how we actually do lots of complicated fancy stuff. Um, I'm just going to. This is a very simple introduction, and it's up to you to take it a bit further. You know, if, if you can and if you want to. So first thing, obviously, you might want to do um, is add some data to our database. So as I said, we use our session factory to manufacture a new session object. We use that, then we create a new class, add some data to it, and then we can use session to save that class to the database. So it's a simple usage, and this is the kind of usage I'm expecting you to do in your uh, web scraping, okay? I'm, I want you to get Hibernate running on your database, and I want you to be able to do basic stuff like adding data to your database. It's not hard, but, you know, fiddly, but not hard. So there we go. So first we create a session. So this is, if this was a single thread, we'd be fine because we're creating a new session here. Um, then we build our instance of a serial class. We set all the stuff we want, you know, to be saved to the database in that class. And obviously this could come from somewhere else if we wanted to save our application state or something like that. Then we do a transaction. So we start the transaction, save the serial, and commit the transaction. So, you know, quite what will happen if we never commit the transaction, maybe it'll be committed when we close, not sure, but this is the correct way to do it. We have a nice modular block of code, and within that, we're shifting the database from one state without this serial um, to its second state with this serial. And then if, we, um, if this goes wrong somehow, then it'll roll back to the state the database was in, in here, basically. It can, you know, it, um, the commit will sort of, you know, if it, if it breaks, um, it, the database will stay in the state it was before the break. Okay. 
Um, and then at the end of it, we close the session. If there's been a database connection, we're going to release it. And then that keeps our enables everything to be handled rather nicely. So let's have a little demo. Yeah? So here's my serial. So here's my price comparison with database in Heidi SQL. If you look at serials, that's what we're going to be changing here. So all the stuff I showed you, right? It's called serials, not serial. And then we look at the data here. We've got like 16, uh, 16 bits of serial. Now let's uh, go to our Hibernate example. So I've got various examples here I'm going to run through. So let's do the add serial one. So if we go to that, then we can navigate like that, right? Uh, it's like control click, um, just like hyperlink. Uh, and then add serial here. It's doing exactly what I showed you. We're going to create a serial that has price. Let's do something slightly that's not in there really, like 31.5, and we'll set the weight to like 5,000, something like that. Okay, so let's, um, let's run that. So we're going to run this code here that I just explained in the lecture. So you've got this sort of uh, logging Hibernate stuff. And then here we go. So firstly, let's check its work. Well, firstly, let's see what we've got. So what we've got here, I mentioned that there's SQL. It outputs the SQL it's using to interact with the database. This is like a debugging feature. And so we can just see what's going on with the database here. Yeah? And then this is my code saying serialize the database with blah, blah, blah. So you can actually pull out the ID because the serial now, the serial class contains the ID that corresponds to the row in the database here yeah? because it's been mapped here. Yeah? So if we refresh this now, we can see that you know, we've got new ID 17, which is the one we thought. It's got like 5,000 weight and price 31.5. So it's kind of worked successfully uh, to insert some code into the database, insert some data into the database. Next thing we might want to do is we might want to update that data, right? So if it's a price comparison website, a new you know, price might come in, a new, um, new price might come in for the same product. So then we need to update the data, yeah? So what we do is use the session factory to get a new session object, same, same as before, create a new class, and we specify the ID of the new class. If we say what ID is in the class, then that controls which bit of data we actually want to update. Obviously, we've got a class that's mapped already. We can pull that class out, as I'll show you when we're doing deleting. But, it, but an easy way to do this is just specify the ID of the new class. Then all we do is we change the data in the class and then set, tell the session um, to update the class in the database. And there's like update or save or update methods here as well. So save or update if the ID doesn't exist, if a row with that ID doesn't exist already, then it will create a new row in the table. Or if we just call update, then it'll look for a, a matching ID and probably throw an exception if there isn't one. And same idea here, we create a new serial, set the ID, and then we can set all the data um, of the, the new data we want in the database. And then we do the same stuff with like, beginning the transaction, call update on using that class. It'll look for a class with that particular ID and change all the data in the database for us. Let's do another little demo here. So we've got all this code as usual. So let's go into main. Okay. So again, that's some, you know, same code, right? Update serial. So if we set price to 40.5, right? It's slightly different from what we had before. So let's run this. So same old stuff. Update serials, blah, blah, blah. Uh, wait a minute, that's the 60, ID 16, it's changed. So actually, uh, maybe that doesn't exist. So let's just change it to, because our new ID was 17, right? So let's just update 17 as well. Assuming it finds it. Um, okay, so it's updated serial with ID 17. So if we refresh it, currently that's 31.5 the price. And now it's changed it to like 940.5, yeah. See the updates worked. And we can go on to the next bit. Now, the next bit um, is searching for data. And I'm a tiny bit skeptical about this, but not hugely skeptical. Okay, so to search for data in Hibernate, um, typically use the Hibernate query language. So this is kind of like SQL. So you might ask yourself, well, you know, why are we bothering using Hibernate if we've got to write SQL anyway? Okay, well, firstly, it's a simplified version. And secondly, it lets us search, it returns, it's a, instead of just returning, you know, data, yeah, which doesn't ma isn't mapped to a class, when we do search for data in Hibernate, we get back a nice, you know, list of you know objects that are mapped that are already mapped. So, although it's slightly inelegant using SQL-like syntax in Hibernate, um, you know, I can kind of see the point. And the other point is, of course, that a Hibernate query language will work across all different databases. Yeah, you just change the configuration file, and all your searches with HQL will work in Oracle, or work in MySQL, or work in Postgres, or whatever. Yeah, so it's got that generality which uh, code that's written for a specific database won't have. And also, if we look at uh, 
it's also not searching within a table, it's searching within a particular class that's mapped to a table. So again, we're not, uh, we can change the database without, the searches aren't um, tied um, to the names of stuff in the, ta in, the, in the database, they're tied to the particular classes. So we search within the classes, even though we're actually searching in the database using an SQL query language. So same old stuff. Um, so we have create a query. So from serial XML, so you see here, serial XML is the class, not the name of a table in the database. So that's nice, right? Because then we're no, then um, you know we can't we have to mess around changing this if we change the name of the class. But at least we don't have to mess around changing this if we change the database itself. Yeah. So we don't have to have the select all because it's going to return a list of classes. In this case, a list of serial XML classes. So you know it's shorter than SQL, more compact, which is good too. And then we have like where price equals five point five. You can do all this sort of SQL magic at the end of your search query. Yeah? Um, and then what we get back is a nice set of Java objects. So it's very easy to kind of iterate through them. You know we can like output. In this case, I'm just outputting a string representation of the Java objects that was returned. So in this case, we're looking for serials whose price is five point five. And if we do that, um, we get you know all the serials whose price is five point five. Un unsurprisingly, yeah. So let's just uh, let's go through this. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Yeah. Right. So if we run our search example, just the exact code I showed you, um, then we're getting four four products. So if we're doing this, so five point five, um, and that's these serials here, whose uh, price is five point five. Yeah. So then we could search and do all kinds of different things. Um, to pull out the different bits of data that we need. And finally, delete data. So there's sort of one obvious way in which we might delete data is just to create an object that has an ID of the row that we want deleted, and then just call delete on that object. Now that works fine um, if there's no sort of foreign key relationships between the mapped classes um, or between the mapped, mapped tables. Um, but it will create problems if there are foreign key relationships. So the recommended way to delete data is we pull out a persistent object that's sort of mapped onto the uh, row we want to delete, and then we delete the persistent object. So instead of uh, sort of creating a transient object um, and then sort of calling delete on that in the database, um, we, we pull out a, a mapped object already, and then, then Hibernate will actually handle the messy stuff or do a better job of cascading all the changes and all that kind of stuff, depending on how you configure the database um, to handle all that stuff. So this is the simple version, right? We kind of get a serial XML class, open up a session, and then we call delete on it, and it'll you know run like delete delete from table where ID equals five, um, but that won't um, necessarily handle the problem of foreign key relationships and cascading. So the recommended method of doing it is we load up a class. Um, with the ID of six in this case, that'll give us a persistent instance of the object. If it's found it, um, then it'll delete that persistent in instance for us. So yeah, so let's do the demo, deleting data. So let's just do the last thing. So, all right. D -d 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 -d. Okay. All right. So in this case, let's have a look. My thing's got an ID of seventeen. Is that right? Uh, yep, so let's try and just delete the row I created earlier. Uh, so as you can see, it's delete from serials with ID equals whatever, and then it bungs in. Um, oh, that's the so first bit of Hibernate SQL is, is pulling out a map class, and then it'll carry out the delete. And if we look at the database now and refresh it, and um, we can see that we've got one row taken out from the table, the one we wanted. Okay, so that's a very, very simple introduction to some basic operations with Hibernate. Right, now, just a couple of other closing remarks, if you like. So, as I mentioned before, the session factory is thread safe. So, it's a factory that can be used by multiple threads uh, to obtain sessions, and the sessions themselves are designed to be used within a single thread. So, don't keep hold of a session and pass it into a new thread or any of that. It's going to create messy problems for you, um, and don't share objects loaded in a session um, between threads. So, as long as you keep that distinction in mind, you'll be fine with Hibernate and threads. There's much more you can do with mapping. I've only shown you the basics here. Um, you can have like mappings that mirror foreign key relationships, you know, in the sort of graph structure of the objects. 
Pretty confident that you can map a single entity to multiple tables. I haven't tried that myself, but pretty confident you can. And I haven't tried join operations, but I presume um, you can have an object that has uh, contains data from multiple tables inside it, um, but, but joined together in a nice way. But again, I haven't tried this. Um, and you know, I have to put a separate lecture on all the more advanced functions, but I'm only expecting you to do the basics for your coursework. So that's why I've just covered the basics here. And already it's you know 89 slides, right? I mean, that's, that's enough for a single lecture. So Spring's got built-in support for Hibernate. So the obvious use of Spring would be to use annotations on XML files, so you could actually inject a session factory into the classes that need to use it. So that would probably that would save us from using might save us from using the Hibernate configuration file. Uh, you can just sort of mix it all, put it all in the same place. Maybe I don't know. I haven't really looked into it. Maybe you can do some mapping. You could actually inject sort of map classes or something. But I haven't tried any of that. But Hibernate and Spring work do work well together. And there's a guide there about how using, using Hibernate with Fiber Spring. So it's five marks in course at one for using Hibernate to store your web scraping data. So I've given you enough, I think, for you to be able to do that in the basic usage of Hibernate. Um, so it's good to get to grips with, get familiar with, and you'll maybe find it useful in, you know, you want to go further with it in course at one, that's of course great. Um, but you might also find it useful in your final piece of coursework for your final year project, yeah? But here, I'm only, you only, you'll get those five marks for using Hibernate. You will not get those five marks um, if you write SQL code to update the data in your database, yeah? So as usual, we've got a bunch of resources. We've got the video, the slides. Welcome to use the example code or adapt the example code as usual. There's a few tutorials and sources of information that might be useful here. Um, I have given you uh, the Hibernate jar files and the MySQL driver for, uh, for Java. You're going to need both of these if you run it just within NetBeans without using Maven. But obviously the easiest way to use uh, Hibernate um, is just put those dependencies in your Maven file and it'll automatically download, uh, download everything you need. All right, so this lecture has introduced Hibernate. Uh, and then the next lecture, uh, I'm going to explain how you can use web scraping to download data from third-party websites.